Welcome to our California Wine Growers Cultivate Healthy Soils virtual event co-hosted by the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, Wine Institute, and the California Association of Wine Grape Growers. We are pleased that this event is a part of California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Week. We have a fantastic panel and a lot of ground to cover. Now I will hand it over to California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance Executive Director, Allison Jordan. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. And we're so happy to be part of CDFA's Healthy Soils Week. The geological formation of California created a large diversity of soil types. In fact, 2,800, including sand, clay, loam, granite, just to name a couple of them. Our 140 American viticultural areas span 635,000 acres, which really also just underscores this diversity. And it's really this magic combination of the state's geography and climate and soil that creates the ideal conditions to grow quality wine grapes. For the past two decades, the California wine industry has become a global leader in sustainable wine growing and healthy soil is really the foundation of this approach. Soil management is addressed in the California wine industry's educational programs and certification programs, including the California Code of Sustainable Wine Growing and Certified California Sustainable, Lodi Rolls, Napa Green, SIP Certified, as well as in organic and biodynamic approaches. I also wanna mention the California Department of Food and Agriculture, USDA Ag Research Service, UC Cooperative Extension, UC Davis, and all of the other great California universities resource conservation districts, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, just some of our important partners on this topic. And today we're grateful to have a great panel that will have their, will be able to give their insights into the latest soil research, as well as specific practices and projects that are underway to enhance soil health. And I'd like to start with Dr. Carrie Steenworth, a research soil scientist with the USDA Agriculture Research Service and I want her to touch on what is healthy soil and just to talk about some of the soil research projects that she's been involved with in the past. Thank you, Allison. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Okay, so today, as Allison mentioned, I'm going to highlight topics that um, other presenters will cover for their work on healthy soils. Um, there's been a wealth of work that's um, occurred over the last few years with the support of the healthy soils programs um, from CDFA. Uh, today, I'm going to, um, this will be a very thin slice of considerations and implications faced when implementing vineyard floor management practices. Um, these examples that we're going to look at today are just from work in California, but there are many key studies on these practices from other regions in the world, such as Spain, France, South Africa, and Australia, and which have similar climates to what we have here in California. Um, as Allison mentioned, wine grapes are grown in nearly every county of California across 10 of our main 12 soil orders, across a range of climates, and across many complex landscapes. And here are some images right here of vineyards from across California. And you can see this types of um, the complexity and heterogeneity of these management practices, cover cropping, uh, compost application, undervine management, or just a number of um, practices that affect soil organic matter storage in our soils. So this is a study that was conducted in Monterey, California, uh, or Monterey County. and. Um, this is, it has been shown that cover crops improve soil organic matter and soil carbon storage as compared to cultivated systems. Larry Bettega, Michael Kahn, and Richard Smith began this five-year trial to look at effects of cultivation versus two different cover crops on grape production. And here you can see that soil respiration is lowest in the cultivated um, soils and greatest in the uh, cover crop treatments. Um, this is the first, on the left, you can see that the red is in, um, is the cultivated soil, and on the right, you can see the two different cover crops that they use. And the reason I'm pointing out this particular um, parameter is that in the first few years, this is the parameter that's going to change more quickly. This is an indication of your labile pools that will change, and this is something that's measured in the Healthy Soils Program. After a number of years, usually up to five years, you start to see these changes in total um, carbon pools um, in the soil. 
And um, you can see that the cover crops also have greater soil organic matter in the top 15 centimeters than the cultivated. And the reason there's a difference between the rye and the trios is because they have different um, rooting patterns. There's more roots below in the trios compared to the rye. And they also commit more um, of their energy early on to root production um, in the trios than the, than the rye do. Um, I also wanted to point out this is an important study because it occurred for five years. And when uh, many of you know that when you're implementing a new soils practice or new vineyard floor management practice that, that it takes a, um, up to five years for the system to come into um, equilibrium with that new practice. And so these longer term investments are important for us to understand how to implement and change um, to innovative practices to um, improve healthy soils in California. Um, here is a study that looks at um, longer term practices. And um, let me just scroll down here for a second. It's really rare to find a trial that runs more than three years, um, but this site in Los Coneros that was developed by the Napa RCD Vineyard um, ran for 22 years. And we came in at the very end and we looked at indicators of healthy soils, um, the physical, chemical, and biological indicators in these different treatments. So one was a no-till, one was an annual tillage, um, which is very typical in, in, in vineyard production, and then undervine, um, practices. In this case, it was um, a strip spray. And our findings here were very interesting because we looked at an integrated um, indicator of the changes in um, soil health and we looked at soil aggregate stability. And what you can see along the x-axis is the no-till treatment, the annual tillage treatment, and the undervine. And on the y-axis, you can see aggregate loss. And what we saw is that the no-till had higher stability for aggregates versus the annual tillage. And we were really surprised because annual um, tillage in um, vineyards is a very low impact practice. It occurs once or twice a year. Um, and it's, um, so we were very excited to see this, this particular um, this particular result because it leads us to um, see that there's a great value to reducing um, the impact of erosion in these systems if we can switch to no-till. We also did another um, study with um, looking at the value of conservation and restoration in um, wine grape production. And as many of you know, wine grapes exist in California within a pretty complex landscape. And there is an ethic within the industry to um, conduct restoration along the farm edges and along riparian areas. And so we wanted to see if there were um, other services and other values that came from this particular practice um, that could be added to the value of habitat restoration. And what we found, um, which uh, is that when we compared these different paired soil pits, we looked at, um, on the left, we can see that we looked at soil pits in the upper 100 centimeters in the wildlands, and we had greater soil carbon content as compared to the vineyards here in blue. And then we also saw the same looking at above ground storage, um, that we can see that in the black, the wildlands had more um, above ground woody biomass than in the vineyards. And um, while this may be logical, this also provides an opportunity for us to look at how to um, increase soil organic matter storage deeper down the soil profile, because we can see that the system has the capacity. So Aaron Lang um, and others on the panel have brought up the fact that many of the vineyards are going through redevelopment. And so this could be a consideration um, to look at how we could change the practices um, or looking at how to set up the, the new system to look at deeper soil carbon storage and trying to understand what those benefits might be for wine grape production. And then finally, um, another area where we could look at changes in healthy soil practices is under the vine. And what we see here is that same study from Monterey County where they were looking at different under vine management practices. And we came in and um, looked at what was happening with the soil carbon and nitrogen dynamics under these, in these undervine practices. We have a strip spray on the left and we have vegetation growth and cultivation on the right. 
And what we saw is that there were reductions in nitrate loss and reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from the one that had more vegetation growth um, as compared to the strip spray. We measured this at one meter. And then um, we also saw increases in soil organic matter because of the increased vegetation growth. Um, we also looked at um, taking this a step further where John, Ron Caroni and I did in a preliminary study looking at under vine vineyard floor management practices to uh, grow cover crops under the vine. And uh, we found that it was a good competitor using Zorro fescue to uh, reduce weed growth. And so uh, it was just very preliminary work. And, um, but it, it poses the question, if we could expand um, and create stable plant communities under the vine, would that be a way to reduce um, inputs of herbicide? Since those are also through um, some studies we did on life cycle analysis, a source of, of uh, um, global warming potential. But I mean, herbicides are very uh, needed tool within um, wine grape production and agriculture in general. So it's a it's a, um, a very careful step that we need to take to figure out how to shift to different kinds of management practices and keep all tools on the table. Um, this also prevent, this is another area of the vineyard too, where if we wanted to expand soil carbon storage, it is, it, it can represent up to 20 to 40% of the vineyard floor. So we could utilize that area um, to increase um, soil organic matter content. But of course, within wine grape production, it's very sensitive because we're not just growing for yield, we're growing for, um, for quality. And there are many considerations to, to take into account before shifting over to a really drastic change like this. But I think that the other growers on the panel, Julie and Gravro, and also um, uh, Steve Mathiason are going to discuss some of these types of practices um, that will increase soil organic matter and bring in new types of plants into the system. So I'm gonna pass it off from here and thank you for today. Thank you so much, Carrie. We really appreciate it. And not only being here today with us, but all the work that you've done over the years. And I all really appreciate your systemic approach to research and really thinking about all these integrated systems. So thank you again for being here. Um, and now I'd like to ask our three wine growers on the panel to share their experiences with various soil related projects. We're lucky that we also have, um, I think a, lot, a good representation of our geography. So we have Lodi, Sonoma, and Napa represented and also different sizes of organizations. So look forward to hearing your comments and we'll kick off with Aaron Lang, who's Vice President of Vineyard Operations at Lang Twins Family Winery and Vineyards. Over to you, Aaron. Great, thank you very much. Really appreciate uh, everyone on this panel and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's really an honor to be a part of this panel with uh, such distinguished members. I mean, we've got Carrie Steenworth and uh, Julian from um, Jackson Family Wines, but also like one of the godfathers of uh, Lodi Rules, Steve Mathiason. Uh, it's awesome to have all of you on, on the panel today. So thank you. Um, I wanted to start out and I'm assuming Allison, everyone can hear me fine. Great. Sure I can, yep. It's odd not seeing the audience at all. It's really an odd thing. But um, I really wanted to start out with a story that I'm robbing from John Brody, who was a, um, an RCD member here in San Joaquin County. Um, and it was when we were doing a habitat restoration project at one of our um, sites near the McCallamy River, and we were taking a break. Um, we had a group of students there, high school kids, um, you know, probably 16, 17 years old, and we were taking a break during lunch, and uh, John reached over and uh, pick some miner's lettuce, which is a, a native, um, uh, a native uh, plant which grows along riparian areas, and washed it off and then put it on his turkey sandwich. Um, and he picked it right from the ground. And a young lady um, who was a student helping us with this habitat restoration project through uh, the Center for Land-Based Learning uh, SLUS program said, ew, you can't put on that on your sandwich. It came from the ground. And you know, and that was just a light bulb moment for, for me and for John when he heard that because there is such this great disconnection between um, what, where we think food comes from. You know, a lot of these kids may not have had the same exposure as we farmers um, and they had a disconnect. You know, food comes from Safeway and not from the ground. And so we think that this soil, this uh, land ethic as Aldo Leopold would call it is something that's not being taught in our school. You know, we teach um, how to uh, relate to other people in the world. Um, you know, the golden rule, we teach how to operate with our communities, uh, but we don't, you know, with democracy or with government, but we don't teach uh, very well on the land ethic, how we should interact with the land and the precious resources that allow us to sustain life on this planet. So I think that's a really important lesson 
um, for, for all of us to reflect on. Um, I'd also like to thank, you know, everything I say here today is something I learned from someone else. Um, so thank you to all those folks who uh, contribute to, uh, to my limited knowledge on this very complex topic. Um, what I'd really like to focus on first is um, how sustainability programs like the Lodi Rules Program or the CSWA, CCSW Program, uh, SIP Certified, uh, Napa Green, these great, fantastic programs, which are all cousins that are going after the same thing, which is growing higher quality wine with more respect for our community uh, and a responsible land stewardship and trying to do it in an economically sustainable way. And so if you aren't involved with a sustainability program like that, you know, look into it, at least look into um, going through a self-assessment in your own vineyard. And it really is an excellent guidebook on what the next steps that you can take along your journey of sustainable farming and sustainable practices. So um, that's where I gained a lot of my knowledge and what we practice in our vineyard operations. And I really encourage you to uh, look into those programs if you're not involved um, already. Uh, one of the things I wanted to focus on now is what we're doing at Lang Twins, which is we're doing some redevelopment of vineyards. You know, there are a lot of vineyards that were planted in the mid nineties that are now aging out. And we're looking at, wow, how do we um, really make best use of our on-site resources and applied resources during this redevelopment process? And I suspect that there are a lot of vineyard operators who are going through the same thing. And we're trying, we're changing the way that we're uh, doing our site preparation. Um, to really try to maximize um, the uh, sustainable methods that we're using to have the best vineyard possible for the next 25 to 30 years. Um, and one way that we're changing, because what we used to do um, in uh, vineyard site prep is, you know, call up the D11 with a big shank and rip like crazy in order to break up that soil compaction layer. Um, and it really damages the structure of the soil over time. And so we have been slowly moving away from the way it has always been done into how can we do this better? Um, and I'm not saying we're perfect because we're certainly not. We're learning along this learning as we go. Um, and I think that some folks may have already been here, but for our operation, we're looking at, we don't think that we need to prepare the soil in the same way that we did on ground that we opened in the 90s. Uh, how can we retain some of that carbon captured into the soil, uh, but still allow to open that root zone for our vines and to uh, give them the nutrients and the amendments that are needed in that soil to prepare that land for the next uh, 25 year vineyard investment. Um, so if you could pull up please uh, uh, the first slide, which is, um, uh, our, one of our EM maps. This is a, a vineyard that we call Burlington. And as we're preparing a new vineyard, um, we really want to look at how did the old vineyard perform? Um, and so in the bottom corner, you can see just a very typical NDVI map, which is just a, uh, a measurement of vigor taken by a, um, a fixed wing aircraft that we would do during the season, just to take a look at where do we see, um, where do we see spots in the vineyard which are uh, more vigorous or less vigorous, um, and this really a measure of biomass. But then we will also will layer on top of that, we have yield monitors on our harvesters to really see where we have higher yield and lower yield. And then we can match that over soil layers. And so we want to be able to take a picture of uh, multi-spectral imagery analysis of how is that vineyard performing while it's a vineyard before we rip it out. And that'll help us identify areas that we need to address during the redevelopment process. Um, we also will drag a, an EM sled, so an electromagnetic conductivity uh, meter or a sled that goes through the vineyard and measures that EC at different measurements, half a meter and one meter. And that's the image you have above. So that is a really good indicator of uh, electromagnetic conductivity, which is an, it's the measurement of that. And it's an indicator of soil texture. Um, it could be water, it could be some salinity indicators. And so we use that map in order to go out and really try to pinpoint where we need to investigate. And so we can establish those patterns and only look at certain parts of the field to map it most uh, accurately. So if you can hit to the next slide, it'd be great. Thank you. Uh, so the next slide here, hopefully will show um, how we are, so if you can go to the next slide, which I think is the tabled uh, 98 Oaks, maybe not. 
Okay. Anyway, I'll, so what we did was, um, if you can't see the slide, we used the EM map and our vigor maps and those multiple layers to go to those parts of the vineyard to have representative samples of where we have, where we want to do our soil pits. So we dig those soil pits in those areas. And then we can do soil analysis, which we hope is representative of other areas in that image, which are, have the same characteristics, the same vigor characteristics or the same electroconductivity. And then once we have that map, we have a really good idea of where we need to apply amendments and where we don't. And so once we have that completed, we will be able to apply the our amendments, whether it's, uh, you know, say it's lime for a pH adjustment, or if it's potassium for, or, and calcium and gypsum, um, we are able to very specifically apply that. And what we're working towards, we're not quite there yet, but we hope to have this implemented in this coming year are variable rate spreaders for open ground amendments. So we're actually only applying the amount we want in those areas. So if we have a field that has you know, a variability of, uh, of pH from 4.5 to seven, you know, we don't want to apply any, any lime to an area that has a seven pH we want, which is you know, ideal for grapes seven or a little lower. Um, what we do want to have a higher amount of lime applied to those areas, which are at 4.5. So with really good mapping of the vineyard pre and post rip out, we are able to really precisely apply the right amendments in the right area. So we're maximizing the efficiency of those offsite resources that we're bringing on site to give those vines the best chance of really having great success. Um, and we're also be able to measure organic matter and apply our compost or cover crop programs. It's very informative. So we're trying to really geek out on the data prior to replanting to try to maximize uh, the uh, uniformity in that vineyard um, going forward. Um, so we're also looking at the way we, how we're going to rip our fields differently. And this is something that has been around for many years. Um, however, um, it, we, in our operation, we're just starting to experiment with it. You know, we, we did ripping in the past, which we broke up that uh, soil compaction layer, which was there, that, um, that root zone barrier for millennia. And we broke that up in the 90s. But now as we're redeveloping, we have to ask ourselves, do we really need to perform that same level of ripping for a second generation vineyard? And I think the answer is no. I mean, this is a unit from Ag Soil Works. I know there are other companies that may have similar ones. But this is uh, the idea behind it is that we GPS the rows exactly to where we are going to be planting and only rip those rows, um, only rip those uh, that row in the vineyard row uh, down the vine row and not the in between areas. So we're able to leave that topsoil in place, not disturb it. Uh, this machine will actually create a delve or a ditch and where you can apply your, your variable rate compost or your variable rate pH adjustments or other fertility right in that area, which is a fantastic way of really focusing your, your work. Um, so, and then you follow up uh, with a, a berm or a bed in order to, um, to plant your vines. And so in that way, I think we're able to disturb the soil less while still opening up that root zone and adding the, fer the fertilizer or the organic matter that we need to establish a vineyard and get it off on the right foot with minimizing uh, damage that we, that we historically were doing with um, broad scale ripping uh, that, and the, the negative effects that can have um, on soil aggregate structure. Um, so I'm over time, so I'm going to shut up now, uh, but I just want to uh, also touch on um, the, the economic, the, the very tough economic limitations that sometimes we have in different regions. You know, we don't sell grapes at $10,000 a ton here in Lodi. Uh, I wish we could, but that does provide limitations. Uh, I wish we can do more than what we do can do. And that is one of the challenges we have is to really identify what's the best bang for our buck to, to really maximize uh, the soil health that helps our vineyard and that's my timer that said shut up and um, anyway it's one of our challenges and we'll get into that more in q a so sorry for being long-winded but thank you for your attention and uh, we'll talk to you guys uh, in a little bit thank you so much aaron and i should mention that aaron is the outgoing chair of the california sustainable wine growing alliance and just has done so much for the industry and sharing his experience so thank you so much and we'll turn to julian Dervo who's now um, the Vice President of Sustainability at Jackson Family Wines. Julian, over to you. Um, Carly, let me know if you need me to pull up anything for Julian or if you need a backup plan. Thank you, Allison. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Perfect, great. 
Um, hi, I'm Julian Gervreau, and um, I've been with Jackson Family Wines going on eight years. Um, and in my role, I, I kind of I work at the intersection of how we as a wine grower um, uh, intersect sustainability and really, you know, make what we call the business case for investing in things like renewable energy, water efficiency, um, uh, climate resilience, and the like. And um, over the last uh, five odd years, we've made a tremendous amount of progress um, to the tune of uh, about a 17 and a half percent reduction in the last five years of uh, absolute greenhouse gas emissions across our scopes one through three um, uh, emissions uh, uh, categories and um, almost a 50% reduction in water usage intensity uh, in our wineries. And ultimately, you know, a lot of our sustainability progress, first and foremost, it, it really comes back to um, baselining um, our impacts and measuring and the importance of measuring so that we can, um, you know, evaluate uh, progress and, and continue to move forward. Um, that all gave rise uh, this earlier this year to a uh, to what we've called our 2030 resiliency plan, which is a, a whole company initiative that's focused on some key uh, environmental um, pillars at this point and some social pillars that we're going to be developing uh, early next year around emissions reductions, water resiliency, uh, holistic farming, and land use practices. Um, we have aligned with um, the international, uh, the UN, the IPCC guidance to um, reduce our absolute greenhouse gas emissions across scopes one through three, uh, 50% by 2030 um, and become climate positive. So sequestering uh, more atmospheric CO2 on an annual basis than we emit every year by 2050. Um, and as a result of those efforts, we partnered with the Torres family of Spain uh, earlier in 2019 to establish a group called IWCA, International Wineries for Climate Action, which is really uh, focused on developing these standardized emissions calculators for the wine industry and then sharing best practices for climate solutions. Um, so shameless plug for IWCA, if you're interested in what, what you can do to start measuring and reducing your climate impacts, uh, please join us and, and have a look. It's um, international winers for climate action. Um, and I think as it relates to healthy soils, as we've done these, these emissions inventories for ourselves, we're understanding and recognizing as is the global scientific community that agriculture can go from being a net um, emitter of greenhouse gas emissions to uh, hopefully a net sequester of, of emissions um, through appropriately deployed um, uh, farming techniques. And in 2017, uh, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from the California Department of Food and Ag through their Healthy Soils program to allow us to start um, trialing some healthy soils practices uh, within a working vineyard in the Russian River Valley, uh, Sara Lee's Vineyard, for those of you familiar with, um, with that amazing property. Um, if we could pull up uh, the, the first image that I have, the plot map uh, of, this, of this trial. Um, we worked in collaboration and are continuing to work in collaboration with uh, the Sonoma Resource Conservation District. Uh, they've been an amazing partner in helping us uh, first get the grant and also to administer um, uh, the activities that we are um, that we're engaging in there. And essentially what we've done is this trial uh, is spread across a Pinot Noir vineyard and uh, or sorry, a Pinot Noir block and a Chardonnay block that you can see there. And we're experimenting with um, six different treatment types um, that kind of vary um, tillage, um, compost application, and cover crops. So um, what you can see is we've done, um, we've replicated it three times, and we're experimenting with um, ultimately doing um, farming rows that are completely non-tilled with cover crops, and then adding compost into that, um, and then doing what we are calling um, a minimal till, which is for us, it's about an average of two to three passes every other year, uh, and then sprinkling in uh, cover crop and compost there, and then uh, doing full till um, for a number of the plots. Um, and then we're measuring ultimately um, some key soil health markers, uh, soil organic um, carbon uh, primarily, and then also some yield and quality markers um, for how the grapes ultimately perform, how the vines perform. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is a chart that 
shows um, kind of what the changes have looked like over the first three years of the trial. I want to acknowledge uh, what Dr. Steenwer said uh, earlier about the importance of doing trials for multiple years. Um, we're only in year three. We've committed to, to keeping this trial on the ground for five years. Um, we'll probably end up doing it for a lot longer. Um, but ultimately, one of the things that, that jumped out, there's not a ton of um, statistical significance here in, in the chart that you see with the exception, the notable exception being um, the rows that received compost, whether they are tilled or not, um, we're seeing some, um, some upticks in um, soil carbon. And again, these are at, at 10 centimeter depth. Uh, we've also taken them at, uh, at these measurements at 20 centimeter depth. depth. Um, but ultimately, our interest in doing this is to try to figure out how we can integrate uh, these practices, um, really, you know, from a farming perspective, and and scale them across um, the various different um, vineyards that um, that we farm across California and Oregon. Um, so for us, if we can if we can see value and we can see benefit and we can start tying um, soil health metrics to better farming uh, and better farming outcomes that is a path for uh, enabling us and, and fostering uh, quicker adoption. So um, just want to recognize the work that, um, that has gone into uh, this trial with CDFA, with the Sonoma Resource Conservation District, um, and all of the, the, the folks on the Jackson Family Wines farm team for um, beginning to, to make this, this shift and this transition. Um, in partnership with this, or kind of on a parallel path with uh, these efforts, we also partnered with the Soil Health Institute. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, uh, what we did there is we did an inventory a few years ago about around um, the potential sequestration capability for um, our natural and our working lands across all of, the, um, all of the acreage that the Jackson family owns in California and Oregon to see um, you know, where the potential opportunities are for um, leveraging the land to serve as a, as a carbon sink. And uh, we came back after doing this initial analysis, we based it on the Comet um, Planner uh, tool, which is a USDA tool. And we worked with the Soil Health Institute earlier this year to have them kind of peer review our work based on um, existing uh, a literature review of existing um, soil health studies, primarily focused in, um, in viticulture. So, um, what you see here on this table is uh, a compendium and you can see some max and some mean estimates here from the Soil Health Institute based on this uh, literature review that they did on about 14 different studies. Um, Dr. Steenworth's work was, uh, was certainly um, uh, featured in, uh, in this, this lit review. Um, but you can see where, um, you know, there's a, a range in here for uh, the potential sequestration value of uh, no and minimal till. Uh, and cover crops, you see the max and the mean that was kind of um, uh, detailed through the studies and then also through compost application. So we see an opportunity um, in reducing tillage, uh, adding more compost to our soils, um, planting um, you know, biodiverse um, cover crops uh, in helping us become better farmers and also having these positive climate um, impacts. So we're gonna continue uh, with our studies and ultimately um, look to, to scale this uh, as we move forward. But one of the key things that uh, has come out as a result of this is the stark need, I think, for um, more, um, more studies like this to help us, particularly in, in Mediterranean climates, particularly in viticulture. So. Um, I know there's a, a pot of funding that, uh, that the CDFA has appropriated every year in the Healthy Soils Program, but um, it just underscores the importance of the need for more research um, in this space. And for us, it's about understanding, you know, how, again, this supports our, our ultimate um, farming um, objectives and goals. And um, we see a lot of potential in investing in the land, investing in healthy soils to really help us achieve uh, a number of goals uh, across the board. So with that, um, I will leave it there. Oh, one other thing that I um, is on this slide that I neglected to mention. Um, we did not study the sequestration opportunities for um, uh, intensive grazing or prescribed grazing on our rangelands. 
but we see it as a significant opportunity and uh, there's a lot of really great work and a lot of really great science that's happening in that space. Um, the Marin Carbon Project is doing some great work. Um, Tomcat Ranch is doing some great work. So there's a lot of folks uh, within California who are um, you know, recognizing the role that, um, that managed grazing can play. And I think for those of us who are um, farmers and vineyard managers, we also see um, the opportunity for the um, integration of livestock. Um, and I think that that, um, that can play a role, particularly to Aaron's earlier point, as we start considering, um, you know, vineyard redevelopments, that uh, vineyards should be uh, thought of as, as opportunities to integrate livestock um, in ways that, that, that support um, the healthy vineyard. And with that, uh, I will stop. Wonderful, thank you so much, Julian. And Julian also has been active with the CSWA board and our joint committee. Um, and I really appreciate Jackson Family Wines always being willing to share their experiences and really have such a significant impact. So next we're gonna go to Steve Mathiason, who is, um, as Aaron alluded to, one of the co-authors of the Lodi Viticulture Workbook, which then became the basis of the California Code of Sustainable Wine Growing. So he's also had a huge impact in the industry. Um, he's now a winemaker at Mathiason Wines in Napa and I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Hello. Thanks, Allison. Um, it was really interesting to listen to everybody and it's, it's pretty cool to see this second generation of Langs pushing the envelope continuing. I learned a lot from um, Brad um, and Randy Lang back in when we were doing the workbook and back in 1999. And, um, and I remember the Twin Oaks Vineyard had the California native grasses, the little three there. And um, it was first time I'd seen that in a vineyard and it was it was really inspirational to see that nice big healthy production vineyard with the native grasses um, just sequestering carbon and just the beautiful oaks around it and so that's actually been a um, touchstone for me along my career is to try to see how we can get nature and vines to kind of come together again here in California. So um, the word, this is our home property and I, I'm just kind of holding my computer up here. So all these all this stuff it looks like chaparral plants and various kind of riparian plants are planted on this stream that's alongside our property. When we bought this property in 2006, this wasn't a stream, it was a ditch. Both sides managed with Roundup, um, you know, the farming mentality being that, um, that you don't want any reservoirs for weed seeds. And so, you, so anything around your vineyard or your property, you want to eliminate any kind of vegetation so that, um, so that you just don't have anything that could possibly come into the vineyard and compete with your vines, basically. And so it's a so in, and with that mindset, fence lines and um, right stream banks are considered management problems that have to be dealt with to make to keep weed free and keep clean. And it's a real um, to me, it's a there's a mind, mindset shift that can happen that instead fence lines and riparian areas and ditch banks are opportunities to create habitat value and 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 get free pest management help in your vineyard as well as beautify the vineyard and, is, and, and, re, and really reduce your management costs because you don't have to spray and weed whack along your fence if you have the hedgerow going along your fence. Now the, you know, the fence, it, you're, once you get that initial planning done, then the fence can just be, be sort of self-managed. We just have to um, accept that it might be a little wild looking. That's fine. And so, so we actually, so, so we vegetated this, it's pretty mature now, as you can see, and there's an oak tree that we just are letting come up here, but you can kind of take a peek down there. We vegetated this back with a grant we got as um, back in 2008. It was a federal grant that we got, we got equipped funding to help with this. Um, there's um, coyote bush, um, manzanita, there's um, all kind, um, California buckwheat is a really great one. And so the idea of the way we picked these plants out was we were looking for plants that would provide year round um, um, flower, uh, flowering. So basically nectar and pollen resources for the beneficial insects. They need, the, most, of the, most of the beneficial insects need nectar and pollen to complete their life cycle. Some, there's a few like anagris that takes, that helps with leaf hoppers, doesn't require the nectar and pollen, but most of the parasitic wasps that manage our insect pests need nectar and pollen. But there's also even with the nagras, we have overwintering issues, um, and so they still have it. It's difficult for them to overwinter in a vineyard. And like there's so there's some recent um, 
research out of um, um, his, um, I'm blanking out on his first name, um, Houston out of um, Berkeley. He was in Miguel Altieri's lab that he actually found that coyote bush, which is kind of here in California, it's kind of considered a trash tree. It just kind of grows up, doesn't take any water. You see it on the sides of roads and stuff is actually a key for overwintering with anagris. And so um, it's a great because it doesn't take a drop of water once you plant it and it just sits there and just kind of does its thing. And it's helping with with leaf hoppers. So, so it's it's part, it's really an area for viticulture for me that I get a lot of joy and satisfaction out of is how do we design our the vineyard ecosystem so that it's more and more self managing and requires less and less, um, you know, regular inputs. And um, it's just it's a really fun fun part of it. So you know, bluebird boxes you can see up there. And it's just really fun. You put a bluebird box, and usually within a few days it's inhabited. And, you know, because they're cavity nesting birds and they, and they don't have a lot of cavities anymore these days because we don't have dead trees like we used to kicking around and then and they eat insects. And so you put them up and then you never think about it again. And they're just out there every day eating insects. Um, and so it's a lot of fun. Um, people did um, really dis fields now. I sort of made the decision, you know, viticulturally, we used to always sort of decide on tillage, you know, um, high vigor, we go no till, low vigor, we till so that we can get the vine balance. And it's a big part of, you know, balance vines for wine quality. I made a decision to bring everything to no till from a, because I just, it's just an environmental commitment that we have that we want to be sequestering the carbon, number one. Number two, um, when Dr. Seenworth was talking about um, aggregate stability with the no till, um, you know, to so aggregate for everyone to get everyone up to speed, soil aggregates are like the little crumbs on a chocolate cake. And, and so aggregate stability is a really key soil health parameter because those little crumbs with a little space in between allow the water to move through. So when we, our rain goes down into the groundwater instead of running off into the ocean, now for also the roots can get around better. The roots can breathe better, so then that way can they can uptake nutrients better, and they can deal with pests better. They can um, and and um, with poor aggregate stability, so a lot of tillage, poor not a lot of organic matter. That you instead of getting chocolate cake, you have chocolate pudding, and so you can imagine that's just a less conducive root environment, and so. So in the short term, it is, it is devigorating to go to no-till, which could be a plus or a minus depending on the on the vineyard. But in the long term, we see I I think I, I'm seeing it come back into balance again, and 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 it's just the we think it's the right thing to do environmentally. We're a small family-owned business, and so I have the luxury of being able to make those kind of decisions. I don't have to extract every single ounce of value out of my vineyards. If, um, I, I can give a little bit back. And so going no-till is one of the decisions that, that we made. So you can see the graph came as kind of come We have here, they're, they're tough to get established, but there's, there are other grasses that are easier, but I just really like the idea of it. So I've been putting the effort into making it happen. You can see underneath the vines here is the compost. That we hand applied this compost. The reason I hand applied it was twofold. One is that, is that we try to keep year-round employment for our vineyard crew, and so um, it's just something to do after harvest. Is I can hand apply it and keep them going rather than use it, if, you know, buy a spreader. It just makes it, it, the um, just a little bit, a few more weeks of employment. But that allows them to then put more on the weak vines and less on the strong vines. And so when Aaron was talking about um, the, it, designing uniformity in a vineyard, I mean that's a huge part of wine quality and it's a huge environmental parameter because you don't when he talked about applying lime where you need the lime and not applying lime where you don't need the lime it's one of those many areas where sustainability and economics come together because if you don't need lime there a you're saving on the economics of the lime and b you're improving quality because the vines didn't need it and so being able to place the stuff where you need it is critical so we put our compost on the weak, more on the weak vines, less on the strong vines. And it's a way to get the uniformity and also save on compost, use it where we need it. Um, and I was interested, so this is, so this is oil in the middle, but turf, don't use herbicides. And so we're under the vine cultivating. Um, I, we like to let the cover crop get nice and tall under the vines. Um, and then we till it in. And so, 
I have wondered about the uh, the net carbon on on with under the vine cultivation um, because you, uh, yeah, you you have the cover crop, so you're adding carbon, but then you're tilling, and so you're releasing carbon. I've wondered on on so I was interested in seeing your data that we're still building carbon when in when with under vine tillage. What by growing things under the the plants and in the winter under the vine compared to an annual strip spray, for what I see after years of annual strip spraying is again we lose the aggregate and and stability the in one, the they call bulk density is another wine soil science term increases because there's less pore space with the annual strip spraying over years, and what I see is then you you really run into nem that's when nematodes really rear their ugly heads one of the f quickest ways i find to get rid of to not you can't get rid of nematodes but to for the plants to get over that the problems with the nematodes that are there is we is getting the the berms with living things growing in them again with the, you know the annual winter cover crop and and it just seems you know if you, you can do nematode counts and you see well, the numbers are still there, but I see more response with the vines than, than annual strip spraying plus nematicide. Also, phosphorus and potassium uptake tends to slowly increase when you when you when you're with the annual um, growing cover crops underneath the um, the vines. Just because again, you're just having biological turnover, and that really helps with the organic acids and the release of of those nutrients, and the and you really start to see these you know um, improvements on those. So um, um, that's about I'm gonna that's about it I think for this little area. But I just wanted to just you know you you get to a point in your, in your career viticulturally where it's you know you, you're going to get a good crop in you know as long as there's not a wildfire and then it's like where do you get your your sort of personal and professional satisfaction and you know trying to figure out how to integrate like you know, native grasses or hedgerows or, you know, um, utilizing these sort of sustainable techniques just becomes really interesting and, um, and really, um, really brings a lot of satisfaction back into viticulture. So um, I hope that people are, are in, agree with that on this journey that we're all on because it's, um, it's really fun. So thanks. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, you got a note in the chat that you get extra brownie points for taking us outside, and I fully agree. So thank you for the tour. It was really fun to see, and I always am inspired by your passion and your commitment. So thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions to kick things off, but we really do encourage audience participation. We'll probably have time for a question or two, and those that we don't get to, we'll be sure to follow up after the webinar. Um, so I'll start... A couple of you mentioned the need for ongoing research. And so I'm wondering, are there promising practices or technologies that require further research and that you'd like to see move forward? Anyone wanna jump in first or I'm happy to call on one of you. <laughs> I can I can jump in. Um, I, I think building on what, what Steve just pointed out about tillage, I mean, tillage for us is, is you know, is challenging depending on where the vineyard is um, moving to a, a, a complete no-till system. Um, and I think one of the challenges or, or at least one of the, um, the, the, the debates um, I'm trying to, I'm losing the word, but the kind of the, 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 the issues with it is whether or not um, tillage um, uh, is better for water holding or, or not. Right. And so I think there's, there's some a pretty robust debate around, uh, whether if you till a vineyard, you know, th there's a requirement to till a vineyard because that breaks up the, the, the soil and allows the water to infiltrate better. And I think that that's something that is increasingly being understood not to be true. Um, and that no till uh, or reduced tillage kind of really helps um, enhance the, uh, the aggregate stability and the water holding capacity. And I'd like to see more studies there and just a further, a furthering of knowledge because it's something, you know, just for us as we try to figure out how to how to scale some of these practices? Um, we're recognizing um, you know, the need to to study that more. Thanks, Julian. Steve, did you have any research projects you would like to see proceed? Um, I, I'd I'd love to see 
Um, I mean, the research is maybe it's more like innovation, research innovation, but um, but um, a like um, organic herbicides are really something that that um, is an area that we really need help with. Um, you know, you because you get into situations with under the vine cultivation, which are very, you know, on, on steep hillsides or steep terraces or those kind of th um, extremely rocky areas that are, it's problematic. Um, so I just would put a vote in for that, but I mean, but um, more, I mean, we really need, this isn't really the healthy soils, but, in, but we have, um, we need a lot more research on biological control of um, pests. You know, we have the, the new, we have, it's, it's the new um, Virginia creeper leafhopper is a major problem. And the Inagris, our local Inagris hasn't really evolved yet to be able to really do a great job of managing that leafhopper. And so, so we, I think we need a lot of work. You know, so, so as that one moves through, it's really screwing up a lot of our IPM programs, both organic and conventional. And so we need a lot of work on that. Um, we need more work on vine mealybug. Um, uh, so more, uh, more in terms of new, better biological controls there. I think I'd like to see more ecological work done on, um, on, on um, habitat in the vineyard. And, um, you know, because that was a pretty big deal that, um, that we learned about coyote bush with the um, overwintering for an agris. And so that, cause that's a very actionable piece of information that, that we can, use in the industry. And so that makes me wonder what else we could learn, in, you know, for creating more stable, um, you know, sort of pest ecosystems in our vineyards. Um, so those are some of the areas I would look at. Ne ne uh, nematodes as well. I mean, I have a lot of, of anecdotal personal observational experience that um, some of the soil management practices really make a big difference with nematodes, but we don't have a lot of data on that. And so that's another area that um, we really don't understand. You know, there's hardly any work on nematodes being done here in California and vineyards. And so, um, you know, the, you know, the nematicides don't work very well. We, we can all agree on that. And, and we don't know much about the um, soil ecosystem in terms of, of um, nematode management. Great, that's really helpful. Aaron or Carrie, do you wanna jump in on this topic? Uh, as far as more research that's, that I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for our, our organization, um, I think that we really need to find a, a better solution to strip spraying in vineyards for weed management. Um, I think that, um, you know, I've seen some comments here in the chat that says, you know, uh, the debate is over, killing is bad. And, um, you know, you can't do that anymore. Um, but I think there's uh, another economic perspective here. You know, if we want to enjoy wines that are, you know, under ten dollars a bottle, um, there are there are certain realist there are certain things that um, we need to, problems that we need to find solutions to that are economically sustainable um, as well as more environmentally friendly. Um, and so that was kind of the balance that I was after. And I think there are some really good options with uh, Zorro fescue um, and other like what uh, Dr. Steenworth had mentioned. Uh, under vine row, uh, low growing cover crops, which can outcompete some of these really terrible weeds that we uh, have in California and that are getting worse and uh, admittedly are getting worse and more prevalent due to resistance to herbicides that currently uh, wine growers are using. And so it's a, it's a never ending vicious cycle of problems that we need to break from. Um, so I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done and on um, what products, what natural remedies can we come up with that are economically feasible for growers in every growing region at every uh, great cost. And I think that is uh, really important research. I think uh, we growers in every area are hungry for, for new solutions and are willing to make the effort to do the research trials and invest the time to, to do it right. Uh, but well, we need help from the scientific community. Uh, we need uh, money from uh, federal and state organizations to help us. Uh, every farmer in his heart is a very responsible land steward that wants to do the very best for his land. And because uh, most of us are multi-generational farmers, um, but we're also not all experts in weed science or soil science. 
Um, we're asked to be politicians, marketers, scientists, uh, viticulturalists, <laughs> artists, and winemakers. Um, so we need help and assistance, and we are more than willing to listen and, uh, and to help do what, we, what is best uh, to be a responsible land steward and really embrace that land ethic that all of us need to have in our relationship to, uh, to our soil. Great. And I'm gonna let Dr. Steenworth wrap up this and then I know we have at least one or two questions from the audience. Actually, I thought Aaron wrapped it up quite well, but <laughs> I, I, I concur. Um, I, I agree with what the panelists have said as far as areas of need and research. And um, maybe one last comment is that given all of this focus on um, working with agriculture to store carbon um, within the carbon economy that one of the things I'm concerned about is um, that we need to also consider the effects of our changing climate on that goal, um, that there shouldn't be too much burden put on agriculture to provide that service that farming is the first priority and that um, that's you know, where our, our focus should, should stay. Um, and so I just wanna thank you for uh, being part of this panel today. Thanks so much, Carrie. Noelle, do you want to bring out any one or two questions that might be? Yeah. Missing? So just to let everyone know, we will get questions answered um, afterwards and shared, but there is one question that came up um, and that was how do you balance the water demand of cover crops um, versus its benefits in infiltration and organic matter and um, soil biology? That's a really tough one because um, you know, we know that, so, so that, that, that um, cultivating everything, you have more water for the vines, right? So, so, and leaving a cover crop in, I'm, in, I'm talking no-till, uses water. So that's when I was saying earlier that you have, to, that there's, that traditional viticulture is you go no-till when you want to decrease vigor, you go, you cultivate when you want to increase vigor. So partly there's vineyard design. And so if you, when you have an opportunity to replant a vineyard, that's a, that's your chance to get more vigorous rootstocks in there that can be make balanced vines with great wine quality and good yields and economics in a no-till setting with less or no irrigation. If you if you have a vineyard that was unfortunately planted with a rootstock designed for full tillage, then and you convert it to no-till, it is tough to because the vigor can can go down and you have and you have more water use. One of the things that we do is we is we're under the vine cultivation. We adjust the width of that under the vine cultivation to um, so in a if it's if we don't think we have enough vigor, we we cultivate a little bit more under the vine, and so and so. But we're still we still flipped in the sense that the vine middles are no till, but our cultivation. Sorry, a cat is bunching bumping against the computer. Uh, the um, we're still no till in the middles, so like in like it kind of get away from okay we're tilling the middles and we have a strip spray non tilled under the vines. Now we we're tilling under the vines and we have our non till in the middles. So that so if we a little bit wider under the vines we can save a little bit of water, a little bit narrow under the vines if we're still trying to get rid of more vigor. And so that's part of it. Part of it is a choice of no-till cover crops. So when we don't have a lot of water, we'll, I'll, we'll, I'll do something like Zorro fescue over the entire middle. So it's not a perennial grass. It dries out really early in the spring. We, we can go to seed, mow it down, and it uses a lot less water than a perennial grass. And then within perennial grasses, you have different choices. So, you know, you can, the little three native grasses or sheep's fescue, hard fescue, I'll use less water the big three native grasses, or if you're really trying to bring vigor down, you can go for like Berber orchard grass or something, uses a lot of water. And so even within no-till, you have a range that you, from which you can choose on, the, on terms of what you're gonna plant and also timing of mowing. So I'll, I'll add one other thing there if I can. Um, I think really the holy grail that, that I'm after is, um, and I have no idea how to get there, but is to find that cover crop that you know will grow, uh, really help with uh, a, a root zone that penetrates into the soil and helps the water uh, penetration that adds organic matter to the soil, but also basically stops growing You know when our vines need the water most and is able to stay dormant at that time, not just in the real middles, but under the berm, I mean, under the vine in the berm, because that would be ideal 
uh, if we could have a, a, a low growing short cover crop under the berm, which uh, outcompetes other weeds. So we're not doing strip sprays, but at the same time won't react and uh, start growing when we're having to irrigate our vines during the hot August uh, months. So um, that is kind of the holy grail that would be fantastic. And that's where I think we need more research and breeders to be working on other solutions to try to find yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. species, right? Uh, which would be just absolutely fantastic. Great. Okay. Well, we're just a minute over. <clears throat> so I just want to thank all of you um, for sharing your insights and experience. And really based on what you've shared today, it's clear there are so many benefits to sustainable soil management, not only improving vine health, but also increasing water infiltration, sequestering carbon, improving water quality, improving the biodiversity of that broader wildlife habitat. And as always, I'm really inspired um, by your land stewardship. We'll be sharing the link to the rec recording. And as Noelle mentioned, we'll respond to any unanswered Q&A following this event. Um, and there are so many great resources related to soil health on the Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance's website, which is sustainablewinegrowing.org. Um, you might also be interested in a two-day soil health virtual workshop that the North Coast Soil Hub is planning in March. I put information um, in the chat. And finally, I'd like to thank Wine Institute and the California Association of Wine Grape Growers for co-hosting and also to CDFA for featuring this event. This event is part of the Healthy Soils Week. Um, you can learn more about the events that have happened all week as well. And I think there's some coming up later today and tomorrow as well. Um, and also about the Healthy Soils Program, which offers cost share funds for growers to implement these practices. So ju just go to sustain, or it's actually um, cdfa.california, so cdfa.ca.gov, and then backslash Healthy Soils Week. And we'll make sure that we put those links in our response to you as well. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it and have a wonderful holiday season.